hello and welcome. Welcome everybody. It is great to see such a large turnout for what is gonna to bound to be a very exciting BMR session today. Um, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Jack, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am one of the CP Solvers team members and I am, I am as always super excited to get to be here to discuss a case with everybody this morning. Um, uh, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, this is a very special morning report that, that, that we have today where we get to partner with UC Irvine um, for what um, uh, is bound to be a very educational case conference. And I am super excited to get to do all of this alongside my dear friend, Anne-Marie Kuhn for today. AMK, how's it going this morning? Hey everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Super excited about this. I must apologize. I might be a little in and out. Um, I'm covering a shift today, but so excited to have this amazing session and just wanted to thank Dr. Barsky um, for putting this uh, together. So would you mind unmuting yourself and uh, telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm such a fan of the podcast. Um, I am a new attending junior faculty at UCI, so I graduated residency two years ago and um, did my residency at UCSD and was introduced to this podcast and always loved morning report and, um, you know, with hopefully, of hopefully the end of COVID, I'm hoping to bring back some of the excitement for a morning report back to UCI. We have some of the best, um, smartest, most hardworking residents, and I'm really um, excited to have two of them um, work through this case. Um, and the, the two that will be joining uh, us will be Roshan and Lindsay. Um, I'm not sure if they're... Oh, there they are. <laughs> Would y'all unmute and introduce yourself? And uh, maybe say something um, fun that you like about uh, your town? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm Roshan. I'm a PGY3. I'm super excited to be here. Um, this is Lindsay. Hi, I'm a PGY2. Also very excited to be here. Yeah, we actually just found out that we're like pretty much neighbors. So <laughs> we're doing this together um, at my house and we're really excited to see the case and um, do some learning this morning. Yeah. We both live in Long Beach, close to the beach. So lots of opportunity to do things outside of residency. Amazing. Well, we are so excited to get to think through this case with you all. Um, um, uh, maybe to before we get started, I can sort of share uh, a bit of a sort of an, an overview of the format for VMR in general. And before we get started, too, I would love to know how many folks here, um, uh, is this your first time joining the CPU Solvers virtual morning report? You can either raise your hand or, or type in the chat. All right, Roshan and Lindsay, that is awesome. And we see some others, Lanny, Nathan, Sarah. Um, wow, so it, um, uh, for those of you for the for whom this is your first time, just thank you so much for joining us. I see, I see Omar as well. Um, really, this is a space where we come not necessarily to solve the case in the first aliquot, not even necessarily to like solve the case overall, but really it's an opportunity to practice something that I think we, we probably all enjoy doing if we're here, which is practicing thinking through and, and articulating our reasoning through, um, through a case discussion, and most importantly, getting to learn alongside our friends and other members of the medicine community. And so for the format today, basically, um, uh, Roshan and Lindsay, we will sort of, um, uh, the two of you will split up in that one of us will, or one of you will pair with myself. The other of you will be the lucky one who gets to pair with Anne-Marie. And then we'll sort of sort of take the case aliquot by aliquot. So one, so one pair of two will do the first aliquot. The other pair of two will do the second aliquot. But then everybody else who's on here, we would love to see and hear your thoughts as you, as, as you share them in the chat. Um, uh, this is sort of, again, clinical reasoning is oftentimes a team sport, whether it's, you know, students, nurses, residents, physical therapists, social workers, case managers, clinic, right? Everybody is sort of a part of solving a case at the bedside. And the same thing goes for here in the case conference format. So please share your thoughts in the chat. We would love to hear how your reasoning unfolds. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to, I think I know for certain, we'll be able to analyze the case and hopefully we'll be able to solve the case as well. Um, um, but let's see, in terms of, in terms of pairing, pairing things up, um, maybe, um, Roshan, maybe you and I can pair up and then Anne-Marie and Lindsay can pair up. Cool. 
And then AMK, do you have a preference on who takes the first aliqua? I'm I'm fine with uh, going with the first aliquot. All right. Because I, I might need to run a little bit later. That sounds good. That sounds that sounds great. Um, well then, um, before we kick things off, I just want to make sure that we also give a chance for Brody and Promise to introduce themselves because they will have very important roles for us today as well, doing the scribing and the, the teaching points. Maybe I can pass it over to you, Brody. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing this morning? Very excited to be here. And, uh, and yeah, I'm calling in from California as well, and I'm doing teaching points today. And, and I'll pass it over to Promise and to introduce herself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see so many friends today. And I'm also super excited for this case. I'll be scribing for the case. And also, I'm a second year medical student at Chicago. Amazing. Well, why don't we go ahead and um, uh, we will let we will let you take over the whiteboard, and then um, uh, we will turn it over to you, Dr. Barsky, for the first aliqua. Okay. And then, yeah, like I said, I might need guidance if the aliquots are you need more information. But here's the first one. We have a 64 year old male who was presented uh, to our hospital by EMS due to syncope and collapse at home last night when he was getting up to go to the bathroom. He states he felt dizzy, the room was spinning, and he fell and lost consciousness. Um, his spouse stated that he was unable to respond um, to her or get up after the syncable episode. And he's been having multiple syncable events for four months, and each time it is the same. He feels dizzy, the room is spinning, and then he loses consciousness. He uh, denies chest pain or shortness of breath. Um, and he, uh, the patient's spouse is at bedside providing a little bit more history. She also knows that he's been weight, losing weight for about two months um, with this onset of the syncopal episode and noted to have hypotension. And he's lost about 20 pounds. He's, mid he's been admitted to multiple hospitals for this, these um, episodes. And he called his PCP last time this happened and he stopped his nifedipine and metformin. Um, and then he continued to have labile pressures at home. Um, he was recently at an outside hospital just a few days ago where he also was um, worked up for pneumonia. And then he was discharged with antibiotics, but the symptoms persisted. And now he is here. Great. Okay, so based on this information, um, do you have any um, thoughts to uh, start out with? Sorry, I, for I forgot who was going to discuss first with me. It's me, Lindsay. Um, the first like thing I think of is cardiogenic with this sort of syncope, um, especially uh, the associated hypotension that Dr. Barsky is mentioning. Um, and then I also think of like a neurogenic bucket when I think of someone with hypotension and recurrent syncope, um, neurogenic has a lot of other things within it, but less, it seems less likely that this is like seizure like episodes. Um, and something I'd want to further delineate is the dizziness, um, as to, is it truly like the room is spinning, um, or is it more like uh like everything's going dark, dark like syncope amazing thought process um i agree those were definitely some of the things that were running through my mind too so whenever someone says syncope as a hospitalist one of the first things i'm thinking about is is a syncope or is it a mimic like you mentioned lindsay could there be a seizure um that can mention syncope or sometimes people think they have seizures and it's actually syncope due to myoclonic jerking or should could it be a sugar problem um so could there be some hypoglycemia um at play as well so I'm really trying to like get a history and then figure out the syncope and then once I have that um I completely agree with you I'm trying to figure out kind of which bucket to put it in um so, you know, if you think about syncope is the brain is not getting enough blood flow and that leads to a loss of consciousness and your body tries to write that by losing postural tone. And so the 
brain then gets enough blood flow. And so the question is like, what's causing it? And so I definitely want to be thinking about syncope is very common. And a lot of times, like up to a third of cases, we don't always even figure out in hospitalized patients, like what is causing it. But I definitely want to be thinking about the life threatening causes like cardiac, like you mentioned. So I'm going to be thinking of red flags, like chest pain, shortness of breath, syncope during exertion or when supine, um, if there's palpitations or a known um, decreased um, in like um, EF, or if there's any concerning things on ECG. Um, and definitely the fact that there's hypotension, you know, during the episodes, like it could be an orthostatic, but if there's hypotension between episodes, that's something concerning um, to me. And I definitely want to be thinking about like what could be causing this like related to the syncope. Um, so definitely going to want to look. It sounds like there's already been an evaluation. So I try not to reinvent the will, but you see, you know, look at past ECGs. Has an echocardiogram been done? Have we looked at orthostatics um, before? Because that's a very common cause. And some things definitely make me think it could be orthostatic. Um, so kind of thinking about those, checking a blood sugar, um, and everything and like try to develop that differential and evaluate for life-threatening causes. Once I have more information, I'm gonna be able to definitely kind of zoom in on the differential. Um, the 20 pound weight loss um, with the episodes of hypotension makes me think that there's probably something pretty sinister occurring in the background of this. So I'm gonna try to like ask about cancer screening um, you know, look at labs, see if there's anything concerning. And then that pneumonia, it's like, was that a pneumonia or could there be some sort of pulmonary mass or something in play there? So I'm definitely going to want to do a really thorough review of records, um, see what's been done, look at labs, and then get some more information from the patient to try to figure out, you know, is there some sort of autonomic at play? Is there some sort of cardiogenic is this a volume problem or could this be like an endocrine problem like adrenal insufficiency or something like that? So um, there is definitely a lot of work to be done. Um, Jack, any other symptoms, thoughts that you have? No, I think, I think your analysis is spot on, sort of like defining the syndrome that we have as a transient loss of consciousness and then focusing on the four S's there, exactly as you did, like syncope, seizure, sugar, or stroke. And then once, like, once we feel like we can, we, can, we can accurately define the syndrome, and it sounds like there's a good case for syncope here because he recovers pretty quickly afterwards, I think the buckets that you listed in terms of the causes of syncope are spot on. And I think we oftentimes try to separate them out of like this, of like if, if X is present, like a sudden loss of consciousness, then it's definitely cardiac syncope. If there's a prodrome, then it's definitely not cardiac syncope. And I think sometimes in practice, right, like we can imagine how, for example, aortic stenosis could lead to a prodrome where someone feels light, lightheaded on exertion and then they begin and then they and then they end up syncopizing. And so I think the sort of story of the prodrome, while it's classically taught as being something that can be a big differentiator, in practice, I found it hard to necessarily differentiate or it's uh, I have found it hard to be a uh, to make it a firm line in the sand, but we're really sort of looking at all the data together to build a case. And exactly as you said, we could have features that suggest it's a cardiac output problem, but also features that suggest that it's a, a systemic vascular resistance problem, given that there's hypotension between episodes. And so I feel like I have more questions than answers at this point in the case, but I love, I love the approach. Okay. Should we do aliquot too? Let's do it. Okay. Um, you, first of all, so impressive your, you guys' thought process. You guys are spot on in a lot of these things. Um, for the past medical history for this patient, um, he has had end-stage renal disease, but he's actually status post-transplant two years ago, and he had um, end-stage renal disease due to hypertensive nephrosclerosis. He has diabetes, has had this a remote history of orthostatic hypotension in the past, but has been well controlled for years. Um, he's had hypertension as well, hyperlipidemia, BPH, polycythemia vera, a non-obstructive CAD, arthritis, gout, restless leg syndrome, and chronic neck pain. Um, his family history, his mother has a history of vasovagal events, and both his parents and grandparents had diabetes. 
He denies using alcohol, tobacco, or illicit drugs. Um, and his meds include amlodipine 5 milligrams, aspirin 81, Coreg 6.25, famotidine 20, gabapentin 300, TID, Norco um, 10, uh, 325 as needed, magnesium, my Fortec 360, um, prednisone 5, Crestor 10, semaglutide, sumatriptan, and tacrolimus, one in the morning, 0.5 in the evening. Um, and then um, his ROS, besides what's mentioned above, uh, like I said, positive for weight loss of 20 pounds, on and off headaches, and then that neck and lower back pain um, that he has chronically, everything else was negative. That's a lot of new information. That's a lot of medications. <laughs> a lot of medications. Um, definitely, uh, I think, kind of expands the differential or maybe it narrows in on some of the things that we talked about earlier. Um, some things that I thought that were interesting in the past medical history is this longstanding history of ESRD, also the type 2 diabetes. So that could point more uh, towards a neurogenic etiology. Um, but also his significant cardiac disease. Um, and then going through his extensive medication list, one that stood out to me was the prednisone. Um, do we know what dose of prednisone that was? I think I might've missed it. Five. Five, okay. And has he been on that dose for a long period of time? Since his transplant two years prior to admission. And is he adherent with taking his medications? According to the patient, he is the most adherent, most compliant. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if his wife agrees. Uh, <laughs> so I thought, I thought that those were some interesting um, pieces of information that I picked up on just going with, you know, our differentials for syncope, um, being on prednisone and whether or not he's adherent to the medication um, could raise my suspicion for adrenal insufficiency as a cause of his um, is uh, syncopal episodes. Um, and then also with like his cardiac disease and um, kind of significant past medical history and the ESRD, he's also at high risk of having uh, vascular issues as well. So uh, I think his physical exam and some of the other diagnostics that we'll get later on will help us figure out if this is more of a cardiogenic etiology as well. Um, and then the other thing, I mean, yeah, it sounds like this orthostatic hypotension has happened to him before. So um, I think his physical exam will be very telling. Compromised. Mm -hmm. I think your analysis is, is, is absolutely brilliant. I really have nothing to add um, in terms of the pieces of the past medical history that you picked out here. And I think really what this, what, what this information does, exactly as you said, sort of helps us to think about how we're going to sort of prioritize the things that we're looking for on exam. I think as we continue to move forward with this case really emerging as one that's going to focus on syncope, we oftentimes can focus on that sort of approach and thinking about the cardiac buckets as well as the as well as the systemic vascular resistance buckets. And we can draw a straight line from many pieces of the past medical history to each, to each, each of those sides of things. I think the most pressing one is exactly as you said, right? If we know that somebody has been on prednisone historically, we could think about a withdrawal of prednisone or another systemic illness as potentially increasing, or, or I should say, as potentially precipitating the presence of adrenal insufficiency, which is gonna be at our side of the low systemic vascular resistance. So that seems like one that sort of rises to the forefront. And I love the fact that you picked that up. The other thing that we can do here is we see we have a background history of longstanding, or, um, or maybe hard to know how longstanding it is, but the background history of diabetes, we know that diabetes can come with a peripheral neuropathy and it can also sometimes come with an autonomic neuropathy as well. So is that is that another piece of things that is potentially related to the prior episodes of orthostatic hypotension, another possible contributor to the decreased systemic vascular resistance bucket. And then we see a number of, of, of underlying risk factors for cardiac disease. A history of end-stage renal disease increases the probability of there being underlying cardiac disease. The hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes also increases the pretest probability of there being underlying cardiac disease, as does, as does the known CAD. So we have accumulating evidence for both sides of our sort of, 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 um, of 
of our syncope bucket. And we really, I think, are going to have to use the findings on exam exactly as you said to be able to delineate this out. If we see, if we hear a murmur suggestive of aortic stenosis, if we see signs of heart block on, on the EKG or signs of a tachyarrhythmia that comes up, that might help us build a case for the cardiogenic side. Whereas if we see that there's impressively positive impressive positive or orthostatics in the absence of a history of volume loss that we might start to focus on the, um, on the decreased vascular resistance side. And then the last thing that I'm having a hard time sort of wrapping, um, uh, building, building into the problem representation, but something that I don't want to lose sight of is the weight loss of 20 pounds over the last few months. And I think if we just think about weight loss in general, it's either going to be due to a difficulty with, right, we have low, low intake or increased catabolism. And the low intake could start anywhere from environmentally or um, uh, environmental factors that could make it difficult for him to access food. We could have problems where he might be feeling weak and fatigued and so might have difficulty feeding himself. We could have problems with mastication, problems with swallowing and, and problems with GI absorption. Or there could be some sort of sinister underlying systemic illness that could be driving a, an an increased catabolic state, whether that's an underlying indolent infection that may not necessarily manifest classically, given the fact that he's immunocompromised. There could be an underlying malignancy, which again, somebody who's on immunosuppression after a solid organ transplant is at increased risk of underlying solid organ malignancies, particularly, um, particularly skin cancers, or potentially there is something else that could be um, uh, that could be another underlying systemic inflammatory illness. For example, amyloid is something that could affect the autonomic nervous system and come with a systemic inflammatory signature. So I think just keeping that DDX in the back of our head, I don't know how to fold it into like to sort of the initial reasoning at this point, but it is something that as, as the case um, as the case unfolds, we're at least going to have to explain the weight loss with the diagnosis that we, or with the diagnoses that we start to consider. There was another clinical problem solvers that I was listening to, and they were talking about like weight loss and the high five sign. And they said, good weight loss is when you want to give your patient a high five. And then bad weight <laughs> loss is when you don't want to give them a high five. And I think that this is like a negative high five sign. I'm, I'm not excited about the weight loss that this patient has. <laughs> couldn't, I could not agree more. I think like you just distilled that, that last like three minute monologue down perfectly. I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. Ready for aliquot three, uh, which will be vitals and physical exam. Um, so his vitals, um, when he came in, his temperature was 99.9. .9. His heart rate was um, 110. Blood pressure was um, 131 over 84 sitting, and I think dropped to 100 over 60 while standing. His uh, uh, SAT was 100%, respiratory 20, and he was breathing on room air. Um, his body mass index was 18. Um, on general exam, he was a cachectic male in no acute distress. Um, his HENT exam was normal. Um, his lungs were clear to auscultation. Heart was regular with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Abdomen was soft, non-distended. Um, he had two plus pulses with no edema. Uh, and neurologically, he was alert and oriented times four with uh, five out of five strength throughout with sensory exam intact and all cranial nerves grossly intact. There was no suspicious lesions on his skin. Okay. Would you repeat um, the pulm and the cardiac exam? I think I missed that. They were pretty normal, clear to auscultation <laughs> bilaterally, right? no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. He was tachycardic. So looking at the vitals first, the things that stand out to me is obviously the blood pressure, um, which is kind of as we expected, um, that it went from 131 to 110 uh, systolic. Um, so he's orthostatic, um, but he is, and then he's also tachycardic. And the 99.9 .9, um, temperature, while it's not technically a fever, it's not completely normal range. So um, those are the things from the vitals that stand out. He's, his respiratory rate is good. 
um, and he's sat in on room air. So it just kind of points me away from a pulmonary direction. Um, and then his BMI is quite low. So it's definitely a negative high five sign. Um, and he appears cachectic, um, which to me points to more of like a catabolic state. Um, as, as compared, I mean, I guess we could ask him also how he's been eating. Um, and then his exam, the fact that his uh, cardiovascular exam is normal, besides being tachycardic, he doesn't have any raging murmurs. Um, so that points me away from a raging murmur being the cause of his syncope. Um, and then he has an intact neuro exam, um, nothing really super exciting on the rest of the physical exam. Yeah, I completely agree. I feel like I don't, I was hoping to like have a big piece of the puzzle on the exam. And I feel like I didn't get that. Um, it confirmed our suspicion about orthostatics. And I think now we're trying to figure out why. And we can tell that the body's under some stress. The heart rate has increased. It's trying to meet this demand, but we don't have a great kind of etiology why. I will say like the borderline temperature um, in an immunocompromised patient, that definitely gives me pause. I definitely want to trend it, see what it is. And this could be like a sign, even though it doesn't meet our official fever mm -hmm. criteria, you don't always mount a fever. And so I'm definitely kind of like putting that and saying like, this might not be normal. Like, of course it could depend on the time of the day and everything like that, but that's definitely something I'm going to be watching out for. And then I, I agree. Like I was hoping there'd be like a skin lesion that might make me think about like a fungal infection or hyperpigmentation or something like that. You know, I was like, oh, maybe this pneumonia is like mycosis or something. And we're going to see a skin lesion, but we really don't have a lot. I will say that like in primary, um, you know, the adrenal insufficiency, if it's secondary to the adrenal gland, um, you're going to get the hyperpigmentation. but if it's a secondary cause and you're not always going to see that, although, you know, if the prednisone is super physiologic, you wouldn't expect it unless the body is under increased stress, which could be the case. And so, um, definitely kind of understanding how much prednisone is giving and do we need sick day dosing and everything here, because it seems like the body is under stress would be important. Um, I'd definitely be reviewing the med list, but I'm not seeing a lot besides the amlodipine. And so I definitely think I agree with you. We're not getting a lot. And I think we're going to have to go on a bit of a fishing expedition. The good news is we don't have to go fishing alone. Um, you know, this is an immunocompromised patient. I would be, you know, I'm hoping the labs will get and imaging will give some direction, but I might get the immunocompromised infectious disease team in, get like a really good social history, kind of ask all the ID um, review of systems, um, you know, really like all imaging and everything to try to figure out what's going on here. Um, Jack, any other thoughts? I have absolutely nothing to add. I am, but I am, I will say that I am picking up, I'm putting on my bucket hat, grabbing my fishing rod, and I'm here to join you all on the fishing expedition. My family notoriously can't catch fish, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> I've, I've never caught a fish either, aside from a goldfish. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> like, like the snack, not, I don't fish for goldfish. <laughs> um, love it. Uh, should I answer some of these questions in the chats? Sure. Uh, yeah. People asked if there's skin, peg, skin pigmentation, hyperpigmentation. Um, honest, not that we had noticed when he came in at least, so it was negative. Um, and then there was a question about his diabetes medications and, uh, he was on semaglutide. Uh, that's pretty much it. He would remember they stopped his metformin. Um, okay. And, uh, the, and then they asked about the heart rate, uh, which uh, w when he was standing up and I did not record that, but let's say it was very positive too. <laughs> he was very orthostatic. Um, okay, so on to the next aliquot, which um, is the basic labs and a chest X-ray. Um, so his BMP, his sodium was 133, potassium was 4.1, chloride 100, CO2 
uh, 22, BUN 42, creatinine 1.4, glucose 278, calcium 10. Um, his ALKFOS was 93. Total protein was 5.7, albumin was 3.4, ALT 55, AST 30, and T Billy was 0. 0.6. His uh, CBC was white blood cell count was 9.7 with a normal diff. Hemoglobin was 16.3, um, hematocrit 50.6, MCV was 76 on that, platelets was, were 180. His INR was 1.1 with a PTT of 24.8. Um, and his ch chest X-ray uh, read, read, rounded opacities in the right lower lung, which might be loculated pleural effusion or mass lesion. Correlate with a CT, <laughs> a CT chest is recommended. And there's a pleural based triangular opacity in the right mid lung, which might be due to etolactic changes and or underlying mass. Again, a CT is recommended. I'm really curious what that CT shows. <laughs> um, not a ton of information that I'm getting from the labs. Uh, I think the only question that I have is, do we know what his baseline creatinine is? Yes, it was um, anywhere from one to 1 1.3. Okay, so not too far off of his baseline creatinine. Um, you know, his blood sugar is elevated, which is reassuring um, given his presenting symptoms of the syncope. Um, his albumin surprisingly is 3.4 despite his cachectic and like rapid weight loss. So um, I was just kind of making a note of that. And then um, the white count was normal and the, um, I don't, oh, the hemoglobin was slightly elevated, but he has the polycythemia vera. So uh, I guess I'm, one thing that I'm thinking about is, is that white count normal for him and the immunosuppressive medications that he's on? Um, given the x-ray findings, this like possible uh, fever of the 99 point something and then the otherwise relatively normal exam, like an atypical infection is starting to really creep up and like maybe some endocarditis or something. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm looking for a little bit of help. <laughs> oh yeah, we can absolutely talk. We can absolutely <laughs> talk, talk through this together. And I will say too, I am. Um, uh, uh, I also am feeling very, very unsure based off of the data that we just got. Like I'm with you. I'm like, oh, the chest X-ray is here, and I would love to see the CT scan before moving forward. But I think maybe I can just sort of, sort of pull on some of the thought processes that I think you just so brilliantly laid out here in terms of thinking about why infection is sort of. Is, is sort of rising to the top. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more why you sort of went to the category of atypical infection here. Like what are, what are some of the features that are making you think like, oh, this maybe isn't our sort of run of the mill pyogenic bacterial infection, but rather maybe something that's a little bit more atypical. Yeah, I was thinking that kind of with uh, how long, first of all, how long his symptoms have been going on. And so he's been experiencing this for about two months. So like something indolent is going on. And then he's also immunocompromised. So they're just at much higher risk of um, not developing your normal community acquired pneumonia or things like that, um, which he was previously treated for. And it didn't seem to help with his um, presenting symptoms. And then as I think someone had mentioned in the, the chat uh, with the immunosuppressive medications that he's on that 99.9 .9 might count as the true fever. Um, and so kind of with those stories that are going um, or with that information that I have in the background and then this x-ray finding where it's not just like a single low bar consolidation but maybe more multifocal was where I was heading towards um, an atypical infection. I think that reasoning is absolutely brilliant. And so like, right, we have sort of our new, our new center of gravity here, which is we have this sort of mass lesion or possible pleural based, pleural based opacity. And I think what I'm hearing you say is like one of the things that that could be is an infection and the type that it would be would be an indolent infection, like mycobacterial or fungal organisms, particularly things that aren't necessarily going to respond to our traditional antibiotic therapy for a bacterial pneumonia. If I were to say like, okay, let's pretend that we go down the infectious route and that all of those studies are negative. Are there, are there other categories of disease when you see like mass lesion in, in the lung or, or in the pleura that potentially come into the fold? Uh, 
like fungal. I love it. it. Yeah. Um, probably not viral. Um, I think that his A1C was only 9.2. I also saw in the chat, so like unlikely mucor pneumonias, but I think that's where I'm at right now. I dig it. I think that's, that is like, like, right. Like for all intents and purposes, our cognitive energy for all the reasons that you mentioned should be focusing on falsifying or proving whether or not these opacities either are infected pleural fluid or an, or an infectious mass. And then I always sort of ask myself of like, are there things that can mimic indolent, indolent infections in the lung? And what could those categories of disease be? And the other one that that comes into play here is the possibility of, of an underlying neoplastic process, right? Is this actually an initial presentation of, 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 um, of a lung malignancy, whether that's a primary lung process or something that has metastasized to the lungs? The loculated pleural effusion, right? Any, any sort of chronically exudative process can cause loculations in the pleural space. Most often that's going to be infections, but malignancies can certainly do it as well. Autoimmune diseases, maybe, but probably less likely given what you mentioned, which I think is a really important reasoning point that we have to prioritize infections here. And then just given, given this gentleman's age and the underlying history of solid organ transplant, we also have to weigh heavily the potential risk of underlying malignancy. Something else that sort of jumped into my brain when we were thinking about this was the sort of, um, the sort of what sounded like a, a peripheral triangular wedge-shaped lesion that, that they saw on the chest x-ray. Whenever I hear somebody say that it's like a wedge-shaped lesion or something that's going to be peripheral in the lung, I always ask myself like, oh, is, it, is there a possibility that this is an, an underlying pulmonary infarction? And if we look at the past medical history, the history of, poly, of, 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 of polycythemia vera, one of the, one of the, um, one of the myeloproliferative neoplasms can carry an increased risk for underlying venous thromboembolic event. So is there potentially a PE that we're seeing on, on or, are, or are we seeing chest x-ray findings of a PE, like a peripheral wedge-shaped opacity that could be reflective of a pulmonary infarct? And if there is a PE there, we'll hopefully get the answer to that from the CT scan. But is there something else that's also driving increased VTE risk, which could be one of the two things that we just talked about. An underlying indolent infection can be thrombogenic. An underlying malignancy can certainly be thrombogenic as well. And so I think that's sort of one other thing to sort of bring into the fold here of like, are, 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 um, are all of these opacities that we're seeing related to the same process or are there potentially multiple processes going on in the lungs that we can relate back to one underlying process? But I think I'm right there with you in terms of thinking about the prioritization of the findings. We'll be able to characterize the lesion better with the CT, decide if it's plural based or parenchymal based, which will help shift our differential a little bit. We'll get to understand whether or not there is, is, is an underlying pulmonary embolism. And then I think we'll, we'll get to sort of double down on the, on the in, infectious differential that you so perfectly laid out, and then also decide on whether or not we're going to bring the malignancy differential into the fold here as well. But I think before we move on, I think the other thing that's important here is to answer the question of could this process explain the initial chief concern, which is like, can we find a way to blame what's happening in the lungs on the, or blame the syncope on what's happening in the lungs? And I think my sort of gut instinct is yes, somebody who has potentially an underlying indolent systemic illness who is profoundly orthostatic, right? We can say that maybe there has been catabolism, decreased PO intake, and generalized weight loss. And those things could be contributing to, to the syncopal process. I think that's one plausible explanation, but we may find that there's sort of that there's actually other things that that um, that are coming into play here that might that might drive down systemic vascular resistance. But I think for me, cognitively, or my brain is now is saying, how do we explain what's happening in the lung? Because it seems like that could potentially explain what initially brought this gentleman into the hospital in terms of thinking about some sort of systemic illness leading to just general um, insensible losses, fatigue, malaise, and these syncopal episodes. Okay, I have, um, that was great. I wish I had you guys when we first saw this case, but um, it's for, for the last alaclot, or uh, I mean, I have a lot of information. Is there something particular? Of course, there'll be a CT chest. Is there, I see an AM cortisol, fungal serologies. Anything else you guys want to see or hear about? Uh, beta D glucan. Yeah. Galactomannan. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Sounds good. Cultures. Um, sputum cultures, basic yeah. things. The what? Blood cultures, sputum cultures, okay. basic infection things. Okay. Yeah. So blood cult. So for micro, his blood cultures and sputum cultures were negative. He actually couldn't really produce much sputum, so it was just regular respiratory flora. Um, his uh, beta D glucan was negative, and so is his galactomannan. His CT chest showed multiple large pleural based pulmonary masses within the right upper and right lower lobes as details above, which are concerning for malignancy. Uh, no pathologically enlarged lymphadenopathy, and there was a thickening of the bilateral <clears throat> adrenal glands, which may be related to hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. And then someone asked for an AM cortisol, and it was 18. Okay. Um, well, with I, that, uh, I was going to say with this elevated, do you have any, with the MCV that's low, any like other like iron studies or anything like that? As well? um, I'm sure we did. I did not write them down. Um, oh, they're not important. Okay. But let's say they were normal or slightly low. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so obviously the CT scan is concerning because the radiologist is telling me to be concerned about malignancy. Um, it's in multiple, so there's plural based masses in multiple lobes. Seems that it's, is it just on one, one lung or is it bilateral? It was bilateral. Bilateral. Okay. Um, without lymphadenopathy. Concerning for malignancy, but that's still not like slam dunk, I feel like, for malignancy and still could be some sort of atypical infection. Um, and the adrenal gland hyperplasia. I don't know if that could be associated with the long standing prednisone that he's been on. Um, it's strange. I don't know exactly what to make of it. Um, and then, I mean, most of the other things that we asked for were for the most part negative. So it's not telling me an answer yet, really. Um, but someone just wrote in the chat, what do they do for a living? And I like that question. And I would also like to know what they did for a living. That's, that's a great um, thought process. You know, I think here I would definitely be having a lot of specialists involved. You know, these exercises, we're trying to solve it alone, but that's not real life. Um, you know, I think here I still want to be looking at infectious mimics of malignancy um, while also evaluating for malignancy. I think here is going to be a case where tissue is going to be the issue, um, but I would still be sending that like broad, like thinking about things that could mimic. Um, I would be thinking about like fungal etiologies, atypical, um, like, you know, um, mucor, um, coccidioides, things like that, um, crypto. So I'd be still be sending a broad um, serum asking our, the immunocompromised infectious disease team to help kind of work through this, um, you know, be thinking about like, um, mycobacterial too. And then also be thinking about like, I don't have a great differential, honestly, maybe Jack can help me for plural based things. Always thinking about asbestos, but I don't really mm -hmm. have a history that makes me think of that. And then I'm be, I'm thinking about like, could it be something, um, you know, like coming from the skin that's invading um, like certain things um, can pass, pass through um, tissue planes, but it doesn't really seem like we're getting a flavor of that, but, you know, I'm just, um, thinking about like, could it, could that, um, be the process at play or thinking about things like lymphoma, Castleman's, um, disease, or just something that's had mets to the pleura as well. So I would definitely be asking to get this sampled, um, probably talking to the, um, VIR, their thoracic team, depending on where they were, um, kind of while sending some of these other labs to evaluate, um, Jack, what else, what else are you thinking? 
Um, uh, I think that like the, the thread that we are on here is the one that I am sort of right is, uh, it's the same thread that I'm on mentally. I think it's really difficult to, dis to discern just based off of the imaging findings here, whether or not this is an infectious process or a malignant process. And I completely agree with you, Anne-Marie, that like thinking about the, the, um, the malignancy mimickers in terms of what infections can do that is gonna be super important here because of, of all of the factors that both Lindsay and Roshan have mentioned in terms of thinking about the, the chronic immunosuppression, the possibility that this could have been brewing in the background for some time. Um, if I could take over the screen for one second, um, I think we can, uh, I may have something that can, there are one way to think about the plural based processes um, that may help us think through um, sort of how we're going to prioritize our work up here. Um, so let me see if I can take this over. Mm. So this is one approach that I have in terms of sort of how to think about plural, um, plural based processes. And I think the two of you, or I should say the three of you have lined up sort of exactly what the two key differentials are. When we see plural based nodularity, the sort of two categories of disease that come to the top is, is this a malignancy or is this an underlying infection? And malignancy is gonna be more common. You can see here that the list of possible malignancies is quite long, right? It can be anything from things in the lung to things near the lung to things far to things far away from the lung. And then again, that could be primary diseases or metastatic cancers. The sort of second category is gonna be a specific plural based process. And that's where I think Mario's question about what the gentleman's occupation was particularly um, was a particularly astute question here, because if we have a, pr a primary plural tumor, we could think about something like a mesothelioma, which is usually gonna be related exactly as you all have said to asbestos exposure. And then rarely we can have hematologic malignancies that manifest on in the plural space. We can have extra nodal manifestations of a lymphoma or a primary pleural lymphoma, which is super, super rare. I don't necessarily know what to make of the absence of mediastinal lymphadenopathy here, but it is something that I'm like, oh, I wonder if that makes a lymphomatous process less likely. Mm -hmm. But then right alongside the malignancy category, we have to think about infections and all of the initial sort of atypical infections that you mentioned, Roshan, are sort of, are, are gonna be on the list, right? Classically, tuberculosis can, can manifest as pleural nodularity. And that's interestingly, interestingly gonna be an extra pulmonary manifestation of TB. So it could be isolated to the pleura and we won't see the classic apical cavitary lesions or other things like that that we may see. You can actually have TB in the pleura alone. That I think becomes relevant because another place that TB loves to go is to the adrenal glands. I usually see it associated with adrenal insufficiency. I honestly don't know whether or not it can cause adrenal hyperplasia. So I think that's one thing that seems like it's possible. And then there's a long list of other of, of other fungal infections that can do it, the endemic mycoses, which I haven't listed here and I'm realizing I need to add, as well as rare things like cryptococcus. And then there's this whole list of sort of, of sort of other potential diagnoses in terms of things like sarcoid, rheumatoid arthritis, and then some rare causes here where you have endometrial tissue or splenic tissue. But those things, right, are gonna be sort of very, very low down the list before we exclude malignancy and infection here. And so then the question comes, are there clues that we have that can sort of shift us one way or, or, or the other here? And I think the question of the, of the adrenal hyperplasia is interesting, and I'm sort of struggling with how to potentially integrate that. One way to think about it is that somebody who's on longstanding prednisone should actually probably have atrophied adrenal glands because they haven't really been using the adrenal glands because they've been getting exogenous glucocorticoids. So if they, the adrenal glands are hyperplastic, right, we may end up asking ourselves, is there excess ACTH secretion or something else stimulating the adrenal glands? We can link excess ACTH secretion to a lung cancer in thinking about ectopic ACTH from something like small cell lung cancer, which is, which is, which is certainly possible. But then we can also potentially link it to an infection and in thinking about these mycobacterial or disseminated fungal infections. Could they infiltrate the adrenal glands and cause the, um, uh, and cause the adrenal glands to enlarge? I think that's possible. But again, I, I would expect that we would see adrenal insufficiency rather than a normal AM cortisol level here. And again, the prednisone should also, um, uh, should also confound that picture and maybe make our AM cortisol low. So I think the possibility of there being ectopic ACTH secretion is certainly in play here, but in reality, like this is all gonna be, this is all gonna be co um, conjecture because somebody is hopefully gonna be able to help us sample that tissue so that, so that, so that we can get a pathologic diagnosis. 
But I think that's one way for us to reason to the final conclusion here is saying, you know, is there ectopic ACTH? And that could be driving the process. But in reality, I think we have to just pursue both of these processes in parallel and usually tissue biopsy as well as some of the other serum markers that you mentioned can be helpful. So I guess that's sort of how I'm framing this together. I think it's a long-winded way of saying, of, of saying, I don't know, but hopefully we at least got to talk through some of the different plural processes as well. We no, kind of diagram. Yeah. yeah. I love so this. This is like a malignancy with a perineoplastic process causing the syncope versus an, a disseminated infection. Mm -hmm. I still have no idea. Okay. Well, I will give you guys the answer in the last dial quad and all the information I think you guys have been asking for. Mm -hmm. um, so he also had a CT head, which was um, unremarkable. He um, ultimately was also noted throughout the um, hospitalization to have seizure-like activity, but his EEG was normal. He also kept having headaches. Finally, he um, did have a biopsy of his, oh, and then his um, quant was negative um, and his AFB times three were negative. Um, he ended up having a biopsy of the lung mass um, which did show cryptococcus infection. Um, he also ended up having an LP done and had um, uh, cryptococcus meningitis as well, which would explain his seizure-like activity, his headaches, his weight loss, and his pneumonia, which was previously treated, but um, did not improve. <laughs> And that's the case. For me, this was a very um, interesting case because I, uh, I um, learned a lot and particularly in this uh, immunocompromised patient, um, he had a lot of things going on with a very broad differential because he had so many um, things contributing. Um, and actually, uh, you know, his, uh, the beta D glucan, which was, we did get was negative, but cryptococcal infection, it's not um, positive. Um, and although <laughs> crypto was on the differential, it was, uh, you know, we did not get the crypto serologies right away. Um, and then ultimately he was diagnosed by biopsy. And that's- Did the crypto serologies get sent eventually? Mm -hmm, they were positive. Were, they were positive in the serum as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, basically everything you guys are reasoning, everything as you walk through the case was spot on. Um, and I think the the uh, adrenal hyperplasia was. I can't really explain that, but maybe maybe due to the cryptococcus. Um, not weren't we weren't sure there, but you know, with treatment, he did improve. Um, and he's doing well now. How is his syncope? Better. He's gained weight. It's, it's, uh, turned out all to be to this 20 pound weight loss and decreased appetite from his disseminated cryptococcus. Wow. I just want to thank you so much. Um, this was an expertly put together case. Um, and I could tell that your care was so thoughtful um, throughout. So thank you so much um, for presenting this case um, so that we all could um, learn um, from this case and just also reaching out to us about doing this. This was um, just a, such a great learning experience. Um, and Lindsay and Roshan, amazing discussion. Um, Y'all were just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Jack, um, what thoughts do you have? Um, uh, I think I share in your absolute immense gratitude. I just want to thank you, Dr. Barsky. I think like um, it is a ton of work to put together a clinical reasoning case exercise like this. And I think the way in which you structured the aliquots, the way in which you sort of gave us some things to go off of, but also, but also uh, withheld data as the case unfolded, like really created such a fun canvas to get to, to get to think through this case on. And I think just super, super, super educational. I can see the ways in which some of the key teaching points were also, were also present in the case and, uh, that I re um, uh, regretfully missed in terms of the beta D glucan negative infections. But uh, I just want to say thank you for putting this together. Like I am incredibly grateful for the work that 
goes into it that goes into this and and uh, I can imagine amongst many many other things that you had to do and I also just want to want to want to echo AMK and saying thank you for uh, or in, in saying thank you to Roshan and Lindsay I think you know to do this is really nerve-wracking and like I feel nervous every time I discuss a case um, and I think the two things that I appreciate so much about what you both did is that you were honest and you were authentic to the reasoning process, right? We started off in terms of exploring the possible common buckets. As the case unfolded, you all started to sort of bring out specific differentials related to who, who this gentleman is and what his past medical history is. And then I think the, the three best words that all of us said at some point in this case were, I don't know, or I'm not sure. And luckily, right, even if we didn't necessarily know the answer, we had the tools that we needed to ultimately get to the final diagnosis. And so I would love to turn it over to the two of you to share sort of any final thoughts or reflections on um, discussing a case in general. But I just hope that the two of you are leaving this today feeling immensely proud uh, because this is a really hard thing to do. And I think you all really role modeled what, what sound and honest clinical reasoning looks like in addition to highlighting what brilliant fund of knowledge you have, which I am sure has come from a lot, a lot of hard work over the years. So yeah, I just wanna say thank you and turn it over to the two of you. I think the most common phrase, anyone who's ever been on my team that I say is, I don't know, <laughs> um, all the time. I don't know, let's find out. Um, so it was nice to have to like start off with something so simple that we see all the time, syncope, 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 and then kind of parse it out into something far more complex where we could see where we would need consultants or other people to help us out, um, and reason through it. So it was definitely challenging, definitely very nerve wracking, but really enjoyable. Yeah, it was a ton of fun. And thank you guys so much for guiding us through it because it just turned it so much more into a conversation rather than being put on the spot. So I had a great time and a uh, really interesting case, Dr. Barsky. So thank you so much for sharing as well. Mm -hmm. Hope you are seeing the immense amount of love you are getting in the chat. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brody to take us home with the teaching points for today. Thank you so much. It was such a good case. Uh, I will echo what Michael said, cryptic crypto strikes again. So, <laughs> well, and then uh, I'll uh, start with the teaching points. We started off with something simple, as we said, syncope, which could be due to a uh, reflex, including basovagal situational, which is mostly having, if they have a prodrome, uh, and then orthostatic, which could be due to autonomic uh, problems, especially in this case where you have diabetes, meds and others, which could be volume or postprandial causes, uh, or then cardiac. Uh, in this our case, we had a lot of cardiac risk factors like ESR, DEH, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which could be under the buckets of arrhythmia and structural causes. Though to remember the mimics of syncope are seizure, stroke, and sugar, which is hypoglycemia. Then weight loss, coming to weight loss, decrease, could be due to decreased intake, uh, which could be due to decreased access, desire, or discomfort. And then uh, malabsorption could be a chronic disease, uh, which could be either endocrine. We had the diabetes, adrenal insufficiency, ESRD on the board, and uh, meds. Probably, I, I felt that semaglutide causes weight loss as well. Then uh, chronic inflammation. In this case, we had amyloid solid organ transplant. Then uh, uh, I guess I can, uh, in immunosuppression, we have a lower threshold for free fever and trend the temperature. Uh, atypical infections could be in indolent like TB, uh, which is more on the upper lobe, PJP, which is more diffuse, and MAC, which is more in the middle lobe. And then post-transplant infections uh, could be uh, community, community acquired pneumonia, uh, aspergillus, myocardia, rhodococcus, crypto, and then uh, uh, and blastomycosis, which should be missed on uh, by the beta D, beta D glucan. And then infectious memory, and could be also infectious mimics of malignancy. Uh, and then I skip that one and go to uh, plural nodularity, could be due to infection. Uh, then other uh, versus malignancy versus other rare causes like uh, endometrium and spleen. The diagnosis journey starts in the chest. We look for looking for lung cancer. They look outside the chest to look for solid organ malignancies, heme, hematological malignancies, sarcoid, uh, rheumatoid, RA, or disseminate infection, and then go back to the chest. And that's uh, a few points which I found interesting where. Uh, 
the sensitivity for first thoracic thoracic could be low and it probably increases uh, with serial thoracic thesis in case of crypto is that I think that that's what I understood from the chat so there you have it and it was a great case thank you for joining us and enjoyed a lot yeah Absolutely phenomenal summary, Brody. Thank you so much. And thank you again, everybody who, who joined us today. Uh, uh, if you are at a residency program or an institution and you're interested in having a similar collaboration, please do feel free to reach out to us, whether it's getting to discuss with you all at UC Irvine again or, or getting to build a relationship with another program. I know uh, I speak for everybody at the CQ's always when we say getting to meet people who share our love and enthusiasm for Clinical reasoning is the thing that gets us up and going to work every day. And so um, please do let us know if you would like to put together something like this. And then just one last final thank you to everybody from Irvine who came out. And again, a special thank you to Roshan Lindsay and Dr. Varsky for a great case. We hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you so much.